Welcome to State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. I got some positive feedback about a previous episode with Derek DeMuth. One listener said, quote, Every time he picked up the guitar, my mind was blown. So check that episode out if you missed it. He's a phenomenal guitar player. Whew. Let's see here. You know, the most challenging part for me in creating this podcast is often these introductions. So I have taken steps to streamline the process, um, but today's episode feels like it deserves more of an extended introduction. So here we go. Today I'm speaking with Kate Basti. She's a dancer and somatic educator. She's launching her own business, teaching and empowering women and developing something she calls sensual movement therapy. In the first part of our conversation, we hear a bit about her life and how she felt called to the Buddhist teachings and also about some of the real tragedies and challenges she faced along her path. And then the bulk of our conversation is about Naropa University and her experiences there and her decision to drop out after completing a year and a half out of a three-year Masters of Dance Movement Therapy program. And so we're planning to record a part two at some point so she can share more about the work she's doing now, but we we actually ran out of time uh, in this conversation. So my conversation with Kate begins about the 11 and a half minute mark if you want to skip this intro here. And just to reiterate what I say here in the intro are really my own thoughts and words, um, some of which go beyond what I got to talk about with Kate, I think partly because we ran out of time. We talk about some of the issues and problems at Naropa University. It's a a difficult subject for me personally. My intention really is not to just criticize the school. As many listeners of this podcast are aware of, I earned two degrees from Naropa and it was a big part of my life in the past. And it's really a special place in so many ways. So. My words here are really intended to be more like constructive feedback. And I've been concerned for years now about the direction the school is heading. And I'm not sure if it will survive much longer if it keeps heading in the direction that I fear it is going. So what I saw at the school is that it's increasingly being taken over by identity politics and by a kind of far left extremist activism and political correctness. And I know this is not just true of Naropa, but of many universities across the country. In fact, as I was working on this episode on July 4th, you know, our Independence Day, there's a new article in The Atlantic by John McWhorter um, about a new oppressive language list from Brandeis University, which includes the fact that saying, quote, trigger warning, end quote, is now not okay. Ooh, (laughs) so the speech police are out and, um, Yeah. (laughs) So before we get into all that, I want to share a little more of my own story here. Uh, Something I haven't talked about as much on the podcast, perhaps, as I could have. Uh, Similarly to Kate, I was deeply inspired by the Buddhist teachings and practices. I had the good fortune to get to study abroad in Bodh Gaya, India. Bodh Gaya is actually the place where the historical Buddha Shakyamuni is said to have become enlightened 2,500 years ago. And then after that, I spent a year studying at a monastic college in Nepal. Um, it was a really interesting uh, time in my life. I, I really treasure those memories. Challenging to live in Nepal a lot of times as well. Um, beautiful, beautiful place, beautiful country, beautiful people. And um, I, I felt drawn to continue the study that I was doing. But I wanted to see if there was a place here in America that I could do that. And I found Naropa University. I moved here and enrolled, and I graduated with a master's in Buddhist studies in 2010. And I feel really good about the two, two and a half years I spent in that program. It was academically challenging and rich and rewarding. It was also very experiential. It included things like doing a month-long meditation retreat at the Shambhala Mountain Center. So it was just this really um, beautiful program that was uh, very deeply based on the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and the traditional philosophical study they would do, as well as the experiential meditation practice. And it, you know, went together so beautifully. Um, And then after several years, I made the decision to return to Naropa to study transpersonal psychology. I really wanted to work as a therapist and as a counselor. That's what I'm doing now. Um, So like I said in the conversation with Kate, I'm really grateful for the work that I'm getting to do now. Um, But when I returned to school in 2016, things were very different there and not in such a good way. So if someone today asks me if they should go to Naropa, I tend to give a nuanced answer. I think for the right person, it can be a really good choice, but 
there's a lot of things to consider before making that leap. Um, so all this being said, I can honestly say that in my first year in the Masters of Transpersonal Psychology program at Naropa, I knew a number of people that dropped out early, and they were all men. So this is not a subject I get into talking with Kate, but I, I, it's relevant. I just I briefly want to go into it here. Uh, so think about this, you know, in my program at Europe University 2016, there was about 100 people enrolled in my class. Of these, about 70 to 80% were women. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we're talking about 20 to 30 men in my year in the program. Now, I definitely did not know all of them. I didn't meet them all. And I wasn't actively researching this at the time. But in preparing for this episode, I looked back at uh, my journal when I'd been kind of writing and thinking about this. Um, I personally knew four men who left Naropa early, at least in part because of perceived anti-male bias. And I know another three men personally who chose to stay, they chose to complete the program, and in their you know, course of being a student there, they were subject to disciplinary investigations by the school. All three of them were prevented from graduating on time, they had to pay substantially more money in order to eventually graduate, and um, two out of the three were fully exonerated after an investigation in which they suffered pretty serious financial, psychological, and reputational costs, as well as taking longer to get their degree, thus preventing them from starting their careers. And the third person I know admitted to the fault of expressing anger in the classroom. He was required to take an extra year to graduate because of this single incident, uh, and he did return and eventually finish his degree. So again, this isn't um, a focus of the conversation with Kate here today, but I just wanted to mention it because I think it deserves to be talked about, and it's a part of the school um, that I just don't hear people talking about publicly, probably for good reasons. Um, but when I think about the details of some of these, these few cases that I personally know, they were infuriating, you know, in part because like the one student was accused of, of plagiarizing, of cheating. Um, there was an investigation. It took several months to complete at the end of it, they were completely exonerated, but there was no negative consequences for the other students who had falsely accused them of cheating. So just things like that. I mean, I get that things uh, can happen at a school, but there definitely seems like they need some better uh, procedures in place to deal with issues like this. So this, this subject probably deserves its own episode. I don't know if I, I will ever go down that road. It's obviously quite a minefield. I'm not sure if it's worth it, but I guess I've I've started down the road, but just by mentioning these few facts that I personally know, my own personal experience. In terms of um, Kate's experience at Naropa, one of the reasons she shares that she chose to stop attending school there was just feeling like the quality of the education wasn't worth it. And so we talk about that, but we talk about some of the other reasons as well. Um, on another note, I went to Naropa specifically to study and learn transpersonal psychology. And transpersonal psychology, at the very least, is a psychology that includes transcendent and more than personal, you know, transcendent states of consciousness and more than personal, like outside of our individual ego states of consciousness. By its very definition, transpersonal psychology includes the recognition that the human condition is not limited to identities such as race, gender, or belief systems. So again, it's just more than ironic to me if one of the few schools in this country, or the world for that matter, claiming to offer a graduate degree in transpersonal psychology, and more than that, a school that was founded on Buddhist principles, which includes at its core teachings like no self, the interconnection of all things, and our Buddha nature, is taken over by identity politics. It's just, it's more than ironic. Um, and on our Independence Day, 4th of July, I saw a quote, which I think is worth sharing. It's a famous quote. It's a quote I grew up with. It's a quote that I deeply believe in. And it's the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And, um, you know, in that same vein, I believe it's, it's wrong to make things that one is born into and about which one has no choice you know, things like race or sex or even the, your economic class. You don't, you don't choose to be born in that. So I think it's wrong to make those into ways to evaluate one's moral worth. 
and it was dispiriting in my experience at Naropa, you know, in, in the psychology program to share my thoughts, for example, about something that we had reading for, like assigned reading for a class, and for no one to respond to the content of what I was saying, but rather to respond to what they assumed to be my various locations in the world of identity politics, you know, a straight, white, male, whatever it is. And then I had the experience of re revealing that I'm actually part Jewish, that I had direct relatives who died in the Holocaust. And then I witnessed people treating me very differently based on that information. And it actually didn't feel good to me. So that was part of my experience. Um, I'm fully aware that it's not just at Naropa University um, that this kind of thing is happening. It's a big topic. I highly recommend the book, The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, who just has a brilliant discussion around some of these issues. Okay, that's all I got for today. And now, without further ado, I bring you Somatic Educator, Kate Boston. today with Kate Basti. Kate, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Of course, my pleasure. And you just tell me a little bit about your business that you're doing. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Kate. My business is called Somatic Untangling. And I came up with it with the motivation of reframing this aspect of self-growth and this has been a huge part of my journey that the Dharma has um, really assisted with mm. is it, it seems like it's less of this of this becoming better or becoming more. Like mm. I used to think when I was younger, I had to be more kind. I had to be more intelligent. I had to have more love, more wisdom, this and that. And then after kind of reading like uh, Trimpa Rinpoche's, um, concepts around fundamental goodness, yeah. as well as other teachers, um, it's like it's more of this untangling process mm. because we have perfect wisdom, we have perfect compassion, we have perfect love, and and we can all mm. access. All yeah, we can all access these things at any moment. And and really, what inhibits us from accessing them all the time are all the delusions that are piled on top. Mm, nice. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like a shift in perspective, a shift in the way you look at it. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I'm so I love using metaphors, metaphors and, and embodiment and anything to do with movement um, mm -hmm. helps me to understand concepts so much better. So for me, kind of this this idea of instead of kind of needing to be more and kind of sitting with that feeling that we all have of like not enough. Yeah. Kind of the remedy. For that would be reframing to like, wait, I know how to be so loving. I know how to be so compassionate. Hmm. I know this wisdom <laughs> and insight and truth is all within me. But what's hmm. blocking me from being able to show up as that, as I want all the time, are these delusions, which all, which is more kind of a, a Buddhist jargon for it. But in... Uh, layperson yeah. terms or normal person <laughs> terms it's more of yeah like the traumas we experience hmm. um or like our conditioning exactly our yeah. conditioning um our attachment systems our you know our reactions and mm -hmm. um to things that have given us reason to be protective right defensive right um so, yeah. somatic <laughs> untangling, self-untangling, instead of um, focusing on this aspect of becoming more. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a powerful message to share. Thank you. Know? you. Yeah. Like, I, I think, I mean, you could listen to that and, you know, kind of debate or argue. I mean, there are a lot of, like, skills. Like, if I wanted to learn computer programming, I would mm. start off, you know, knowing nothing, and then over time mm. I would learn more. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're speaking to are more these, like, intrinsic qualities that mm -hmm. don't operate in that framework, or they don't need to. It doesn't really work that way. Right. right. 
<laughs> right. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think and that's a really great distinction. It's like, yes, of course there is specific things where we need to accumulate knowledge of like yeah. how to do. Yeah, things that we aren't inherently born with the wisdom around that, but um I think this is in terms of uh, exploring self or non-self, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. untangling the selves, the identities that we yeah. get so attached to and the hardwiring reactions that we have that often lead us to so much suffering. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. There's a lot of like paradox, like human, I feel like human development is such a tricky subject to talk about because totally. <laughs> it's just, it's for some reason, it's not like a, you know, one plus one equals two kind of a thing. Right. Yeah, you can, I mean, the, it's, yeah, it's complicated. Like, you could be really great in one area or in one domain. Um, like, you could be an amazing, you could be an NBA basketball player or something. Mm -hmm. Like, how developed are they mm -hmm. at basketball? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're good at a relationship. <laughs> or, right. or even paying their taxes <laughs> or whatever. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah, you're so right about that. And that actually almost kind of brings up this other aspect of the different types of intelligence. Yeah, that we hold. Right. Yeah. And that's something else I'm passionate about and that kind of coincides with the somatic untangling work that I'm doing because as you know, like there's um there's the emotional intelligence yeah. that we access. There's the of course the intellectual IQ intelligence, which of course we put a lot of emphasis on in the West. Standardized <laughs> testing, the education system, things like yeah. that. Less about emotional intelligence. Um and then there's this kind of newer, no, it's not new, it's been around since the dawn of time, but more of an acknowledgement of it would be the kinesthetic intelligence, mm. the body intelligence, right. the somatic intelligence. I totally. think that's kind of what we're... Like that deserves its own Excited category. about. Yeah. Totally. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well. Like I kind of liked your example of um, the basketball player, you know, being great, maybe kinesthetically, mm. knows exactly how to move his body and how to react and all these things, but then perhaps can't hold on to a relationship or, or is just kind of overall an emotionally miserable person. And those are perhaps different types of intelligences that are accessed. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's like this <laughs> kind of ongoing human drama, I feel like, that keeps repeating itself <laughs> of like people... I guess it could, be, it could be man or woman, but for some reason my mind sees it more with men. Right. Where you like strive so hard, you struggle so mm. hard, you become the millionaire that you were trying to be. Yeah. And then, of course, you're not happy in the ways you thought you would be happy from right. those material things. Right. And it's, it's really not just about the material things. It's about, mm. I think what you're speaking to, like that kind of efforting, that kind mm. of trying really hard to control everything. Mm. Doesn't translate to these other areas of our lives, like family and like mm. spirituality. Mm. Mm -hmm. Feeling connected to the universe, you know, right? It's good. <laughs> totally, so. totally. I feel like if you, if you, at least if I've boiled down Buddhism and the Dharma teachings to anything, it's it's just simply the way we are choosing to respond in each moment. Mm. The choice of responding. Nice. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> a simple way to do it. Yeah. Right, and I mean, which is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember my first my first Buddhist teacher, and that was one of kind of the pivotal moments for me because I struggled so much with anger and reactivity. Mm. And he had in his past as well, which is why he gave so much helpful insight to me on a developmental level. Um, he's like, you have that choice in that split second mm. before you react. And even just the concept of, hey, guess what? You have a choice. Even if it's this tiny little narrow window, hmm. the awareness of choice in that moment made all the difference to me and being in like noticing that adrenaline that arises, being like, whoa, physiological response, emotional anger, <laughs> and then being like, wait, okay. And, and I love His Holiness Dalai Lama talks about this, being aware of consequences, right? Like, <laughs> in like one talk I saw him do, he was like, you know, I get so angry sometimes, I just want to kill someone. But then I remember if I kill somebody, <laughs> I go to jail, I was, you know, all these things. He said that. <laughs> yeah, in one of his That's wonderful funny. talks. And it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, ah, oh, yes. Taking into consideration consequences and then being able to in, make that informed choice. Hmm. Yeah. Which is pivotal. Easier to say than do sometimes, but yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> 
which is why we're not all enlightened yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I was curious to hear a little bit more about like your life and how you got to be where you're at. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Hmm. Just feeling into where I want to start. Um, well, to keep mm -hmm. it on the topic of Dharma, yeah, uh, to keep it kind of focused through that lens, I would say, I mean, I didn't grow up with spiritual parents. There was no kind of Eastern influence. I yeah. grew up in San Francisco. So I guess there was a, a liberal, more open-mindedness to <laughs> like those types the of Bay things. Area. Bay Area. San Francisco, born and raised. Um, so did, you, did you grow up with no religion? Um, my mom dragged me literally to Sunday school every morning oh. at an Episcopalian church. And, she, and then I hated it so much. And I would always be questioning the teachers because they would talk about God and whatnot. And I was like, well, and I, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> but she said, if I got confirmed when I was 12, I never had to go back again. So mm. I got confirmed and then I never went back to church. Is this Catholicism? Okay. Uh, Episcopalian. Oh, okay. But I went to all Catholic schools, unfortunately, but it's because <laughs> they have a great education. Hmm. You know, they have a lot of money, let's be honest, a lot of wealth. Hmm. Um, so they provide a, a decent education. Um, so a lot of the private schools are Catholic, especially kind of in the Bay Area. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, I take that back because I went to the University of San Diego, and that's in San Diego. So, hmm. And that was, I guess, they call it Jesuit. But, oh, yeah. They founded a lot of schools, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Interesting. So I've had that influence all over the place. Um, but from a very young age, I always said, one day I'm going to be a Buddhist. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yes. I, I, I knew it. <laughs> I, I well, la, 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 who knows? <laughs> but but yeah, I always said one day I'm going to be a Buddhist, but I can't yeah. yet because I don't want to disgrace the religion. I yeah. I know it's it's I mean it's funny and it's sad that that yeah. was my perspective. I there is something about Buddhism that was so sacred to me, hmm. and I felt like I wasn't worthy of being wow. part of it. Interesting, yeah. And I remember when I met my first teacher at 21, I said this to him because he asked me, he's like, something tells me you'd be interested in Buddhism because he's a longtime practitioner. And, um, but I went to him actually originally more for uh, like coaching and mm. with like the Enneagrams. I don't know if you're the oh, Enneagram yeah. personality types anyway. Yeah. Other thing. <laughs> um, and he started laughing when I said, I don't want to disgrace the religion. He started <laughs> laughing at me. Not at me, but just, you know, with, with, with lots of love that, oh, that's like, mm, like so sad that you would think that. Oh. Um, and that's when I, I got very uh, comforted and enthusiastic about this concept of um, fundamental goodness. Because hmm. as we know, Buddhism isn't about, you know, being good enough. It's the reminder of you're already there. Hmm. You're already good enough. And I love, 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 love. The other thing that His Holiness Dalai Lama says, which is that self-doubt is a form of laziness. Oh, wow. And so yeah. that that was a huge turning point for me. So it's like, because mm. I was just plagued with self-doubt, self-consciousness. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Have you, have sure you heard people that? Heard him say that? Yeah, or anything kind of around I've heard, the um, perspective of doubt in Buddhism. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think a lot of people can relate to you talking about having self-doubt. Absolutely. And um, more than that, self-negativity. And I think our right. whole society is like a wash on that. It's like yeah. our thoughts tend to be so negative towards right. ourselves. Um, right. In terms of like doubt, I've heard from the Buddhist point of view, like mm -hmm. there's like good doubt of like investigating clearly, logically, seeing things as they are, like looking, investigating. Mm -hmm. It's like a positive use of doubting something. Like, is this right. true? Let me investigate and actually come to a conclusion and not spend the rest of my life doubting mm -hmm. what that thing is. Yeah. You know, um, versus like a kind of doubt of like, like, yeah, I'm not good enough or this kind of like uh, existential doubt of everything, mm. which I think is so easy to do in today's day and age because we're in the age mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. Like we can't, we're overwhelmed with too much information that we can't mm -hmm. sort through it all. Mm -hmm. like, the, like this is a podcast there's like a billion podcasts now like mm -hmm. you can't <laughs> right. you can never listen to them all of you you know yeah and so like the amount of information out here out there is so vast so i think it can yeah. lead to this kind of doubt that's kind of paralyzing that's like not mm -hmm. actually helpful 
Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, on the other side of it, like in Zen Buddhism, like they really emphasize this like mind of not knowing, mm. which in my understanding is like not intellectually thinking that you know this thing to be, you know, mm. like to be able to go beyond your conceptual mind. Right? Mm. Like mm-hmm. that is what I think they mean by when they talk about the mind of not knowing. I don't yeah. think they mean to like stand for an hour in the grocery store and try to decide what you're going to eat because <laughs> you're filled with doubt about. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know, Indecisiveness. No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So that's my take on it. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mm, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, especially, and this is this is why I appreciate having conversations like this with other people that have actually studied the Dharma, because I feel like most of my community is like new age spirituality, mm-hmm. coaching, tantra, right. intimacy, empowerment, Everyone's talking about magnetism and mm. whatever. Like law of attraction and stuff. Right? Yeah, totally. But yeah. like even more woo woo, right? <laughs> even more woo woo. And, <laughs> and, you know, but there's just, there's still so many relevant gems that are coming out of the Dharma and that can land, that are these, these very deep concepts, but put by these brilliant teachers sure, like yeah. his holiness like like when i say when i when i said you know and whenever i say this to someone but like when i shared with you just now of like the concept of self-doubt is a form of laziness it kind of takes you like mm-hmm. oh it's like a, a sword right yeah. it's like manjushri yeah. just going whoosh, through the <laughs> through the bs right and um it's kind of like oh wow and it almost gives you this reorientation because no one wants to be lazy. Yeah, that's not <laughs> <laughs> And so if it's like, okay, I'm doubting myself, that's lazy because the idea behind it is that's just a delusion that you don't, like the reason why you don't believe mm. yourself is just a delusion. It's, it's almost like a waste of time. Mm. Yeah. Like why would you ever second guess yourself? Of course you can do that. Or of course you can do this yeah. or that. Or of course you're worthy enough. To be here, to be loved. Hmm. Why would you ever think differently? Yeah. And those are the delusions. Yeah, we, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We yeah. all do. <sighs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting one that we feel, we tend to feel like unworthy often. Or, I know I've experienced that, like unworthy of what? Of like existing? I don't know, like it's interesting to like follow that down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I've had that. That's exactly like, what, it, what yeah, I lead to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of where it goes. Yeah. Yeah, just like, yeah, my right to existing. Not not to, I mean, at least personally, not to the point of, like, suicide, because that's, that's like a whole other extreme kind of mm-hmm. yeah. uh, state. But just, I think a, a, a lot of us, just to be seen mm. by and witnessed mm. by somebody else... Or to be able to even just be with self. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how difficult that seems to be. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, well, there's so many, like, why? Like, there's so many maybe reasons, I think, yeah. that you could give. Right. Absolutely. And I love having this conversation as to millennial people Mm -hmm. because i feel like most people that are having these types of conversations um tend to be maybe much older or kind of more in the extreme yeah uh, maybe like religious place or something like that but and a lot of the people that i see having these types of conversations at least with our age it's definitely um kind of with this this like i was saying before this new age Mm -hmm. lens that has a lot of um fluffy words i don't know (laughs) like do you kind of know what i'm talking about yeah i totally i totally know what you're talking about okay it's not necessarily bad but no well i think it's rare to um talk about things like dharma from right like actually having studied it on a deeper level like actually being connected with the lineage right that seems that seems so pretty rare. Mm. I think for younger people, it's more rare. And then it, there's something more, I think it's more vulnerable. Mm. Like if I'm just being me and this is just my opinions, mm-hmm. but if I want to, you know, like I went here and I studied with this teacher and this is what they learned is like, and I'm connected with this lineage, there's a lot more responsibility maybe. Maybe that's part of it. 
Yeah. But also more power, and I think more, um, mm-hmm. like, there's a reason why these lineages are around and why they've existed. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I agreed. Um, <laughs> I took my, my five, like, layperson precepts with my teacher, my now teacher, and, um, I mean, there's something else, you know, with a, with a you know, monastic... None. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm here with my like flowing hair and you know, like whatever, living a different lifestyle, but there's something so um yeah, sacred, a, a, like a different type of sacred responsibility mm-hmm. when you um are like committed or in devotion to a lineage like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Maybe maybe life. all the negativity around religion in general. Oh like yeah. The, you know, monk nun monasticism is what not what a lot of people want. So right. if that's the lineage that maybe feels like shaming to them or doesn't feel good or doesn't right. you know, so Yeah. There's a lot of I think there's a lot of factors, a lot of things going on. Yeah. Well people I mean the West is so good at picking and choosing what they want to keep and what they want to throw out. Yeah. Especially when it comes to Eastern traditions and, um, you know, yoga is a great example. Yeah, absolutely. And Tantra, great example. Is <laughs> that where they could use for a lot of different things? Oh my. <laughs> so I, th- I, guess, well, I guess what I want to say about this, in, at least in part, is that yeah. there is... Um, there's like a good and bad there. I mean, there's a give and a take. Like there's honoring the lineage, but I think some people maybe go too far where like their whole purpose seems to be to preserve these traditions, mm. A through Z, and then you could like lose like the living essence of it, right? Mm-hmm. And then I mean, the other side of the extreme, if you're just gonna try to toss it all out and do whatever and pick and choose, I think that isn't sustainable in the long term. It doesn't actually lead mm. to the kind of results that mm-hmm that these teachings are meant to get us mm. to. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. I mean, that's why we can really appreciate the middle way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to like extremes, but yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time around monastics as I'm sure oh, really? you have. And you know, it's then you kind of transition back into this world and yeah, it's, I mean, there seems to be, I seem to find different types of contentment mm. in each of the extremes. Interesting. That's why yeah. it's hard to choose. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's amazing that in our, our world today, we can have these different experiences. Like, oh, I actually think that's yeah. beautiful. Like, someone so, can go for a week or a month on retreat. That's beautiful. It's amazing. They come back to their life. And, like, in one lifetime, we can live, like, a hundred lives almost. Mm. And I think that's true in a way yeah. today that just wasn't true for most people in the past. Yeah. You know, like the way we can travel, the way we can mm-hmm. move around, the way we can um, have access again, all the information or these, all these different things. Absolutely. So it's just, it's a huge issue. Like, I think we as a society have a God shaped hole in our heart or our mind. Mm. Like we, the old religions are kind of, they seem historical. They're like things from the past, mm. but all the, we're like we're then we're in search for meaning on some level right. whether we're aware of it or not and oh, we yeah. fill it in all these different ways exactly you know and in yeah. the past things were more simple because you just were in one time and place and culture and now we have a million times and places and cultures available to us like on the internet or on a right. movie or on a book or people we meet yeah. and for better or worse i think it kind of we're all kind of trying to figure this out together <laughs> well, the metaphor that immediately came to mind for me, which is kind of more of like a psychology marketing purposes, but the success of Trader Joe's. <laughs> the success of Trader Joe's is about the fact that they've made the choice for you already. Oh, you yeah. go there. There's less choice. There's less choice. <laughs> versus you go into a huge supermarket and there's right. this plethora abundance and then you get into the indecisive you know like oh my gosh um versus trader joe's is like here this is what you want to buy is a good thing. this is the here product you for yeah. you and yeah we're overwhelmed by choice that's we're overwhelmed apple by is kind of like that right they're like the most successful oh, yeah. company ever and right they gave us give us less choices right mm-hmm. and um or is like simon sinek i don't know if you're familiar with him but uh, he's the guy that you know talks a lot about the start with why when marketing, and that's the success of Apple over 
other ones like Windows and whatnot is because mm. Apple started with why you should have this product and then ends with, and it's an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> but they go more into the emotional aspect of why mm. this matters. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so I guess I kind of want to, <laughs> so you clearly got interested in Buddhism and Dharma uh -huh. and that. And then part of why we started talking is you eventually found your way to Naropa University. Yeah. So I kind of want to transition the conversation there. Definitely. And then maybe come back to more of the Buddhism and yeah. more of what you're doing now. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so it makes total sense to me that you were yeah. interested in Buddhism. You heard about this university and you moved to Boulder to go there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I um, had heard about, well, obviously... Obviously, I'd spoken before about my interest in Trimpa Rinpoche's teachings and whatnot. And, mm. um, and he, so he was the founder of the school. Founder of the school. Um, and a long time ago. <laughs> and, and yeah, it, it, you know, this is the only, I believe, this is the only Buddhist contemplative university in the U.S. I think so, so far as I know. And so... With that very vibrant <laughs> title, um, technically it's it calls itself a Buddhist-inspired university, right? Because yeah, because they wanted to make it a little more inclusive, yeah, which I understand. But now they've gone to the extreme, <laughs> <laughs> as I experienced in Europa, where it's like whoa. Um, but basically, yeah, what what led me to there. Um, and interestingly, both of my Buddhist teachers had some reservations about what they're teaching there. Oh, really? And now I understand why. They said it's pretty, you know, it's, it's um, what's the word? Uh, not conflicting, um, but controversial what they're teaching there and how they're teaching it. And now I understand because um, there's a whole, not a lot that's relevant to the Dharma. Mm. Um Right. That was part of what got me interested in you and why we started talking originally. And right. It's actually kind of somewhat rare, in my experience at least, yeah. to meet someone else who came to Naropa because of their interest in Buddhism and Dharma. Mm -hmm. And that's right. kind of, a, that's ironic to me. Totally. That's not what I expected when I went there. Right. Okay. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I not, don't know if that was your experience. Yeah. Not one other, no one else in my program okay, is no interested else, in Buddhism. <laughs> Which no is, one else came for Buddhism. Which is I came fine for Buddhism. If, if you're not, I mean, maybe there's not as big a market for. <laughs> no, there's not. There's not. There's definitely not. I mean, that's kind of in the story of my life, and probably a lot of people on this path's lives. It's just like, oh, you're finding the little nooks and crannies that are relevant uh, to you know. You see the rainbow prayer flags, and you're like, oh, home. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I, what led me there, so I already have a master's in leadership studies that I got from the University of San oh, Diego, yeah. and um, they were so inclusive of everything in that program. It was two of the best years of my life. It's wow. called the School of Leadership and Education Sciences. The professor I worked with the most there um, had his own personal interest in, in the Dharma. Hmm. And so he had a whole mindfulness and leadership course oh, cool. that was, you know, we talked about the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, like the first day. It was huh. incredible. Um, he also created this course called Love and Leadership, where he, it was kind of a little bit more about all the different, you know, spiritual hmm. aspects um, and examining from more of an academic lens, like the way love has been experienced and practiced and how that relates yeah. to leadership that's fascinating was yeah. that did you know that going into it or is that surprising no i didn't um i went into the program just because i was more <laughs> um fascinated by just the good reputation i was working i was assisting someone that was getting their doctoral hmm. degree in it and i was um i was teaching uh meditation for um uh, like third, fourth graders, and he was doing oh, a study cool. on it for his doctoral program, and so he would kind of witness me and um, do the the teachings for the little kids, and it was part of his thing. But um, 
Yeah. yeah. I was just laughing because yeah. it sounds like, so this first master's program at San Diego, oh. you weren't expecting a lot of Buddhism, but you found a lot. And oh. then the second yeah. one, you were expecting a lot of Buddhism and you didn't find found any. None. Found none. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It totally. It was, it was a very funny karmic cosmic joke, but <laughs> which all worked out perfectly. But basically the end story is that it was meant for me to arrive in Boulder mm. and this was the only way I was gonna be drawn to Boulder. Cool. So yeah. it was meant to be. But anyway, so I've yeah, the leadership program was phenomenal. I was I ended up I was teaching meditation for um undergrad and grad students. I was teaching twice oh. a week for like three and a half years there because I started a meditation group for people that wanted to practice. Um, so I was very much like involved with that in my personal life and the San Diego community and then offering it at University of San Diego. Um, so I was able to to bring, it was I was encouraged and celebrated mm. to bring it into my program there. Mm. Um, I did two independent studies. One of them was in Indonesia at a oh. um, Sakyadita conference, the International Association for Buddhist Women's Conference. Oh, I gave cool. a workshop on yeah. compassionate leadership to nuns. Um, the following summer, went to Vietnam. I created a, a, a four-day program called Bodhisattva Leadership for monastic nuns, the Vietnamese mm. nuns, at three different monasteries. Like, And I got to do this all for credit. I got to make, oh, um, yeah, independent study. And so I was like, this is fantastic. And then I was able to parallel kind of the theory and practices we've learned in leadership to that in the Dharma hmm. as my thesis. Hmm. And it was, it was, so it was fantastic. I was like, this is, this is the best. Um, so I fast forward a few years, I was home in San Francisco hmm. My dad had just died. Hmm. Our home in Napa just burned down. Jeez. I had a second huge wave of health issues, spine hmm. issues, vision issues, hormone, hmm. just the works. Wow. And I was in a clearly a very low place because all these very tragic, shocking things had happened. And, That's a lot. And yeah, and um, I was introduced to ecstatic dance. And oh, cool. in five rhythms, an authentic I movement. I love five rhythms. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's wonderful. And San Francisco has a, an abundance of that. They have this. Mm. It's called the Talmapa Institute in Marin. It's they combine art therapy and movement therapy. Um, mm. I actually was, and, and I was working with a somatic experiencing coach mm. who was actually a personal student of Trimpa Rinpoche way back in the day. Um, she used to be a professor at Naropa. And I went to her because I was having all these panic attacks because my mm. system, my nervous system was just fried from all of this. And so that was my first taste with somatic experiencing, oh, Peter cool. Levine's work. Yeah. So it was like all these little building, you know, things. And I was, and then I experienced ecstatic and five rhythms. And I was like, oh my gosh, because I was always been a technical ballet dancer. Mm. It's like, oh my gosh, I can use dance as a form of therapy. Yeah. There was this one whole day workshop at Tamapa Institute where we danced to a live cello all day. Wow. And I did that very soon after my dad's passing. And it was, it was more therapeutic mm. than the talk therapy mm. I was in. I processed so much and was able to draw with the artwork. And I was just like, okay, I, this is what I want to do. Mm. I want to yeah. become a therapist, a dance movement therapist, to help people move through grief and mm. bereavement. Yeah. So I had heard of Naropa. I remember going on their website and seeing masters in dance movement therapy. And I was like, boom, here cool. it is. Sounds perfect. At a Buddhist university. <laughs> I'm going. This is this is my next this is my next journey. So that's how I got there. Mm. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. <laughs> <laughs> I had my whole curriculum and my mind planned out. Yeah. I had even gone, I will share this, I had gone early to meet with the director of the program, mm -hmm. the, or the chair of the program, um, and I asked her pointed questions about my interest in Buddhism and the parallels of using dance movement therapy as it relates to the Dharma. And she was very open about answering them, which kind of gave mm -hmm. me the perception 
Hmm. that I would have an opportunity to include that. She even said, you should focus. I said, what is the role? What do you feel is the role of dance movement therapy on the path to enlightenment? She's like, that's a great question. And you should focus your studies on that. Yeah. Wow. And I was there for a year and a half and there was not one opportunity to even write a paper on it. Really? Yeah. It's sad. So didn't obviously didn't wasn't what you were hoping it would be. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> we probably danced and moved in like two classes. Really? That's that's a crazy, right? It's a it, dance movement therapy program and you're not moving your own body. It didn't make any sense. And huh. and the movement ac- exercises we did do cuz sometimes we'd begin the class with maybe just like five minute, you know, do your own thing and yeah. stretch or whatever. Um, it was so basic, Julian, hmm. to the point where you're like, you know, the people coming into this program should already have this type of wisdom, hmm. should already have this type of knowledge. If they really want to become a dance movement therapist, we should be doing more advanced. Yeah. It's like super basic kind of. So basic. <laughs> the breathing, the meditations, anything that we did was right. very basic. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think it's good. You're like speaking honestly from what yeah. your experience was, what, was, what it was like. And yeah. maybe it's worth naming that like your experience was in that particular program. It doesn't right. necessarily speak for the other programs the school offers. Right. But I think some of what we might talk about in this conversation does apply to the school in general. Hmm. But maybe good to make that distinction. Mm-hmm. But in this particular yeah. program, like you come in with a dancer background, and which right. makes sense, and it just t- yeah. totally doesn't meet you. Right. Is that an attempt to make it more inclusive, or because they're scared to challenge people? Because that's kind of been my experience mm. in Europe. Like, there's like a fear to challenge students. I love <laughs> that you said that. You nailed it. Yes. There is a fear to challenge. It's, it's fact, pathological at some point, right? It's well, like, <laughs> it's so funny you just said that. Our prof- one of our professors would say. When they asked us to think of some kind of emotional event, she, they'd say, keep it at a two or a three on a scale of one to ten. Hmm. And we, I don't think we ever were, al- were allowed or prompted to bring something in that exceeded a four. Wow. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So is this a year and a half you're there out of a two-year period? <laughs> out of three. Or, or three year period? So you're there for half the time. And it probably wouldn't have changed if you'd stay the whole time. Like, you, they're not training. Like, as a therapist, you should be able to hold space for intensity. And that should be the place to learn to do that. <laughs> the pressure Not the cooker. place to, like, yeah. learn how to kind of coddle and kind of baby people. And right. How That's not going to serve you yeah. if you really want to be a therapist who's meeting people in crisis and exactly. trauma, who've dealt with things like, you know, rape or incest or exactly. violence or their exactly. house burning down. Like, those exactly. kind of, yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, where's the room to practice meeting people on that level? The, 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 all the classes were just kept at such a superficial level Hmm. and anytime, and maybe you experienced this in your program, anytime there was an invitation to go deeper, everyone was terrified to do that Hmm. because of the 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 how do I put it like the lack of safety and trust that was established between the professors and the students mm. and yeah. between and amongst the cohorts and between, yeah yeah there was just this heavy cloud of shame and judgment. Oh, <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> ironic. <isn't it? laughs> Did you, <laughs> does that resonate at all with what you experienced? I mean, to be honest, it does. And I think I've been carrying some sense of like, was that just me? You know, but like, <laughs> talking with you and other people, I know it, it's not like, right. like you're in the classroom there and there's space to talk or ask a question. Yeah. And there's like this fear of, cause you don't want to be judged by other people, even though you're learning how to hold a non-judgmental space, you know, how to, I mean, non-judge, be non-judgmental is so fundamental to mindfulness and to Totally. Most forms of therapy. I don't think any form of therapy is telling the therapist to judge their client. <laughs> right. Like to, it, there was some, okay, I guess if I was going to speak to this, there was like this atmosphere attitude that yeah. definitely came from the teachers and setting up the classroom of like, let's be professional here. It was like this fear of, um, yeah, fear of crossing some kind of line that wasn't like really clearly named. 
Mm. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what words to put to it, but I totally know mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, like, the fear to cross and yeah, line, uh, lines that were unnamed. Like there was, there was almost, I want to say at least for our professors, a lack of awareness around the environments they were creating. Hmm. And which is shocking because these are all <laughs> therapists, PhD, not all of them. <laughs> our neuroscience professor was an acupuncturist oh, really? because they couldn't find anyone else to teach us neuroscience. And I love her as a person, wonderful person. Yeah, but you felt like she wasn't really qualified to teach the Absolutely not. Subjects. Well, and it broke my heart because I liked her a lot as a person. Okay. And everyone was really hard on her. Oh, everyone, wow. there was actually people in my cohort that in a very nasty way tried to get her completely, like, fired. Oh, man. Instead, she became the chair of the department. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Naropa. <laughs> <laughs> well... Okay, to go back to what I was just saying, maybe another yeah. way to say it is like an, an atmosphere of not wanting to offend or again challenge or yeah. challenge people too much or like to coddle that word mm. to kind of caretake. I think that is part of where it was coming from. But um, yet there was no coddling. The professors, there was no coddling. There was, I. Okay, there, sorry. No, no, this, please, yeah. <laughs> I would say there, well, I think there was a lot of coddling in the sense of trying to prevent someone from saying something that would be offensive. Would that be fair to say? Hmm. Like, like preventative like, measures. Like preventative. <laughs> for going too deep. Potentially. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, I have to be honest, I feel traumatized from this program. And I do not say that lightly as someone who is now helping people move through trauma and as someone who's yeah. experienced tragedy and as yeah. somebody that has been very close and loved very deeply people who have been through horrific trauma. I do not say that lightly, but there was a psychological trauma in this program. Well, maybe maybe we can dig down there a little bit. Like, what do you mean yeah. by that, by trauma? Like, when I hear that, I hear there was, like, leftovers that you're still working through that right. are negatively affecting you in your life today. To right. Way. And I think, and, and, and it comes from a place of just deep disappointment mm. in not being met. In, in having this vision of like, I'm like, I know what I, how I want to serve people. I know how I want to show up. I want to be a dance movement therapist so I can help people through their grief and their bereavement. Like, hmm. you know, just feeling like, oh, this is, this is the bridge that's going to help me get to the purpose that hmm. I've so long to find in my life. Yeah. You know, and, and so I right. speak to this disappointment of my experience in Naropa from a place of do you know Naropa do better hmm. there's people out there that want to make such a difference that are so excited 50% of our class dropped out jeez and the people that have stayed unanimously nobody likes the somatic program yeah. I can't speak to the other programs. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of, so I think this piece that you're speaking to really is maybe about that program. Maybe it's going through transition. I think yeah. it's a newer program. It has its issues. It's been around since the 70s, oh, but really? there was a change in leadership. Okay. And the best class yes. I ever had <laughs> in my year and a half was when the woman, Christine Caldwell, who started the program in the 70s, came and guest taught. Oh, cool. We danced. We moved. We emoted. It was phenomenal. Awesome, yeah. That was the program I came here for. Yeah. I've definitely had the experience of like a lot of the original faculty and people that founded the school and started these had a lot of inspiration and energy oh, yeah. and creativity and they were taking risks and chances. Oh, and, yeah. Um, Phenomenal. Yeah, so it's... And we read her content too. Hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. I loved her concepts. Yeah. And... <sighs> <sighs> there was this... <sighs> Hmm, not, the professors didn't quite, 
I feel like we weren't able to experientially <laughs> practice those concepts in the classroom. Hmm. They gave us a ton of reading. That's the other ironic thing about the somatic program. <laughs> so much reading to the point like where more the reading than that. <laughs> oh yeah, well, to the point where the professors actually said to you, "You don't have to read everything." <laughs> like we know it's a lot. You will be overwhelmed if you read all of it. Pick and choose. Fine. Thank you. Appreciated. However, this is, should be an experiential program. Yeah. And then we sit in the classroom and talk about not even the reading. Right. But I don't even know what we were talking right. about. Right. What? Are, yeah. Where did this year and a half go? <laughs> okay, well, I was just sitting there traumatized, blacked out, not knowing what was going on, Julie. <laughs> it's getting really bad in the somatic program. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I haven't even. Oh. Well, okay, let's, I kind of want to slow down and like, Absolutely. part of me is, it feels, it just, it feels challenging for me on a personal level to talk about this, but I wanted to on a podcast yeah. and, um, yeah, obviously I have two degrees from Europa and it's been a big part of my life and, mm -hmm. um, I have mixed feelings. Like there was a lot of good that came out of it. I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. And um, the work that I'm doing now is so rewarding and meaningful. Mm. So I'm really grateful that I have the degree that enables me to do that. And I'm living with the sense that I had to learn a lot in the two, two and a half years since I graduated mm -hmm. and unlearn a lot. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. true for me. Like to be an effective, yeah. powerful therapist in the world, like I had to... Right. There's a lot more training that I needed, and that's frustrating when you're paying what is it, twenty, thirty thousand a year? Oh yeah, it's a very expensive yeah, it's like yeah. school. <laughs> it's an expensive school. And so, I mean, that was part of. It's kind of one of those things. Once you start it, like, okay, I could stop, but then I lose all this money. <laughs> so I made the choice to finish it out. Right. Um, yeah. And that was a tough one for me because, you know, I'm like, did I just waste thousands of dollars? Mm. But, and, I, and, and I'm glad that you brought us here because I will speak to, it didn't feel like a waste. Yeah. I feel like I learned a lot about um, client therapist real dynamics. Nice. Yeah. That was the one, one thing that they excelled at teaching at. And I appreciated that. And, um, I felt like I learned how to listen mm. with more than my ears in lots of different ways, which I've been able to use both professionally and personally. And I feel like they did a great job at um, this concept they call titration, right? Mm, yeah. Being able to process yeah. through and... To go slower, right? And right, and, 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 and not having things... Um, I guess being being aware of how of yourself, how you're showing up in relationship to the client, making yeah. sure there isn't personal bias that's being projected into the space. Basically, anything that would cause harm for the client mm -hmm. that you would typically, if untrained, unconsciously bring into the space. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is the that is the um, difference between the training that I feel therapists get from coaches. Because hmm. I've had a lot of experiences with coaches or some kind of, yeah, um, not my current coach, I will yeah. say, because I love her very much, <laughs> but past coaches, other types of um, health professionals, you'll have that experience where they bring their personal crap in and yeah. you're like, yeah. Boundary somehow something just whoa. Yeah, I, I've had that experience too. I think the world of coaching is like the wild west, and there's all <laughs> kinds of people out there. And you kind of one month know. certification, <laughs> go. Yeah, I mean, it's just like whatever. <laughs> um, there's or a, no there, certification, go. <laughs> there, well, I think there's a real danger to yeah someone working as a coach, traumatizing or shaming or kind of actually slowing down someone's path mm. by pushing them so hard, like mm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but right. I think Naropa, I mean, speaking more generally, there's a yeah. lot of really, really talented therapists and teachers and people in the world who went to Naropa and had a good, I've put that education to good use and had good experiences there. Yes. I want to name that. Yes. And um, even people like in the program with me, like some of them may be more, have more negative things. A lot of them would have more positive things. So mm. it was like a mixture. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But it sounds like in your program in particular, there's a lot of issues going on and yeah. the cost. And um, maybe this is a bit of the story that I make up about it. I don't right. know how ultimately true this is, but mm-hmm. that like back in the day at the founding of Naropa, when we had Chogim Trunk by Rinpoche, was yeah. this crazy wisdom, <laughs> alcoholic womanizer running the show. <laughs> People were, it was like a big party scene. People were taking risks, like I said, like it was cutting edge. And then maybe it has reacted against that. So mm. that maybe this other extreme of like trying to be very, very safe and very, very politically correct and very. Well, um, you know, what happened in Shambhala yeah. happened. Right. Recent? That's, I'm well, it's been happening. In theory, Shambhala and Europa are totally separate now, but um, that's true. There uh, has been a whole other scandal in Shambhala. <laughs> Right. But well, I don't want that to, that yeah. doesn't necessarily speak to Naropa as an institution today. I don't believe, I'm sure people out there might disagree with that, but the fact is, I agree. because of the scandal with Shambhala, the, the first scandal with Shambhala, <laughs> or one of the first, the earlier right. scandals, they yeah. separated. Um, but that yeah. is their history, and that, that scandal with Shambhala that recently happened yeah. is really terrible. And so there's all kinds of scandals in that realm. But, it, mm-hmm. but I think that speaks to my point that because mm-hmm. of those scandals, the, the school has tried to protect itself and separate itself and get mm-hmm. away from that kind of thing. And right. maybe some of their attempts to do that have been kind of counterproductive to the students because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thank you for speaking to that and, and distinguishing those things. Cause I think that's very valid. Um, because it almost, yeah, you're right. Shambhala, Naropa. And I think that's been, Part of the shift is almost, um, you know, really secularizing Naropa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to move away from that history. To move away from that history. I would even go as far as to say, at least in the somatic program, there was a complete removal of anything spiritual. We had some mindfulness readings there, and, mm. you know, they, they kept uh, the bow. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Before and after class is like, okay. Um, but the pr- there, there was conversations around cultural appropriation for Western people that are practicing Buddhism. Hmm. Or, or any maybe religion or Eastern religion. Particular. Right. And the part that I had an issue with, because one time I, because I habitually just kind of will like bow and do this because I've done this a million times as a thank you. I did that to one of my professors as I was leaving and she goes, you know, I think Buddhist people would find that offensive. (laughs) And it made me feel like, okay, A, you haven't been listening to me in class. B, you haven't been reading my papers. I have taken the precepts. I don't go around going, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> but but you, I, I identify. Yeah. I have stu- I've been studying the Dharma. Like, yeah. you know, at what point, like, what, what does she feel, her own experience of me, that has her completely negate and forget that that's actually part of an identity of mine? Right. It's a, it's a great story. It's a great example, and it's fascinating. And it's like, right. who gets to be the arbiter of what is offensive or not? And right. I have never met a Buddhist practitioner who is offended by someone bowing to another person. Well, she's not Buddhist. She's very Christian. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, not yeah, but just like she's saying that it might be offensive to a Buddhist somewhere right. across the world or something. Maybe that's true. Right. But, yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, even if someone wasn't Buddhist and they bowed to a Buddhist, a Buddhist wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Right. They'd be like, oh, thank you. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Or not think anything of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think there is definitely a piece um, that was saddening around, and I think this feeds into what other. Um, programs perhaps have experienced and not only and I will share this not only with Naropa but I've had a conversation with someone at the CIS the California Institute of Integral Studies in Mm. San Francisco in the somatic program and they said a very similar thing is happening there where there is this um, huge huge emphasis on awareness around privilege Mm -hmm. And exploring the different levels of 
multicultural and multiculturalism and how it shows up in psychotherapy, which mm -hmm. so important, so necessary. Glad we're finally really having those conversations. Yeah. And at what point is it so overemphasized that it starts to detract from mm -hmm. learning um, mm -hmm. about the content of, of, I mean, like, for example, dance movement. Right. <laughs> Learning about dance movement, yeah. <laughs> You know? Because <laughs> uh, in my, we had one class that was dance movement therapy. Yeah. But instead of moving and learning how to, like, I was excited. I thought we, were, we would be facilit learning how to facilitate um, dance movement therapy sessions with groups or one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. There was, like, a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, but mainly it was sitting around and talking about, I mean, there's an entire class devoted to um, colonialism of ballet. Mm -hmm. And it was presented wow. yeah. in such a way that... I mean, I hurt. Like, I grew up as a ballet dancer. Mm. Other students did, too. I said something to them at the end of the... Or the middle of the class to the professor. And I said, you know, the way that we're speaking about ballet is feeling like it's really... Um, it feels shameful that this has been such a beautiful healing part of my life. Yeah. I'm grateful for the awareness around its history. And... It's an art. It's a beautiful art that yeah. take that requires a level of discipline that most people will never experience in their life. Hmm. And how can we also honor that in the same conversation? Yeah, right. To have like and a she apologized. That honors, no, she didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's good. To the whole class. And other students were even like, thank you. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the, that didn't land it landed poorly for a lot of the students in that way. So yeah. there's all these levels yeah. of sensitivity this is such going a big, on. Such a big issue that like relates. Yeah. I think it's happening at universities across the country. Yeah. Like universities in particular. And I think it's um, at its best coming from a good place of wanting to address these difficult issues of racism totally. and of colonialism. Totally. And those are important. Absolutely. And then it, gets, it can be taken to this extreme where it, it's like that expression, like, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm. You can put on the lens of uh, racism, privilege, whatever it is, white supremacy, and you could see yeah. everything through that lens. And right. it's not always the most helpful, accurate, or true way to look at the world. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and, like, who gets to make these determinations? Like, if you look at human history, it is a history of different cultures coming together and influencing each other. Mm. And so for someone out there to, you know, be an activist, a social justice warrior to talk against cultural appropriation. And if they want to come and then say, oh, you can't become a Buddhist because that's this Eastern religion and you're, colon you're col white colonizer or something like yeah. that. And then for like a Tibetan Lama who's born in Tibet to like travel to this country and tell people everyone can be a Buddhist if you want to be. Yeah. Everyone is Buddha nature. You can realize it. It's not that mm -hmm. big a deal. Like who are you, like who gets to make that call there? Mm. You know, just in the Absolutely. Buddhist example. But there's so many other examples. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious, as you are holding the power of white male <laughs> privilege, how, you know, if that showed up for you or in your program. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it absolutely did. And it, I think that was a big part of the atmosphere we were talking about earlier of, of like, being careful what you say because you don't want to be shamed or called out. Right. Um, and, again, that can be coming from a good place of wanting to address these difficult issues. But if the effect of it is to silence people where – they're not speaking their truth because they're afraid to, and so they're just sitting there listening or saying something that's not really true for them and internally having their own dialogue. Like, that's not helpful. Absolutely. If, if you're, like, shaming people and, like, I, I have so many stories of this kind of dynamic at Europa in particular going awry. Mm. And I, to be honest, like, when I started this podcast, I thought this could be a place to talk about some of that, and I mm. haven't really up to this point. Because it, feel, it feels difficult, and it's like, yeah. I don't want to... I want to also acknowledge the good things about Europa. I don't want to yeah. like, talk bad about it, but I think in the way that some of this social justice stuff has taken over the school, I think it's had negative effects. And like, mm. so like one example I can give is it's, it's the, it's like the first week of the first semester and we have a class on, what was it called? Multiculturalism, social yep. multicultural counseling. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's all good. There's two people teaching it. Okay. That's good. We have two people holding it. Um, 
on that first day of class, they had us line up in a line mm. and they read a statement and step forward if that's true for you, step back if it's not true for you. Yep. yep. <laughs> and so all the statements are around privilege and identity and race right. and that kind of stuff. And so the point of it is to see your privilege. Right. At the end of the exercise, there were two or three guys at the very front wall. You know, people kind of scattered through the room, some people towards the back of the wall. Because um, you would also take a step back if, mm. um, if it was like the opposite or not true for you or something mm. like that. Um, but to do that the first week of class without first building trust and rapport, getting to know each other, a step, like a foundation of safety, and then have those couple guys at the front and then everyone look at them and then let's have a group conversation about that. And how does it feel to you to be, oh, we're not going to ask you how it feels to be at the front of the class because you're... Right. you know, the most privileged person who's dominated the most space historically or culturally. So let's hear from the people at the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess there's a certain logic there, but the result was not good. I don't think it helped people to, yeah. it just didn't feel, it felt poorly done. I could put it that way. And yeah. then, I mean, in my case, it was both of those teachers first time teaching that class. Mm. So give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But the, I mean, that class really went off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, one of the students in the class to give an example was a, a white guy, heterosexual, I, I think, who was also a military vet, who also mm. came from a very poor background, mm -hmm. who had traveled across the country to attend this school, who was in search of his own healing mm. and wanted to be a therapist, a healer himself. Mm -hmm. And he dropped out after that first semester. And I don't blame him because he didn't experience himself as holding a ton of privilege. Mm. He experienced himself as coming from a pretty hard knock background mm. who had mm -hmm. worked really hard to get where he'd been, even though to war. Right. right. And so that, that's one example. Right. Um, yeah. There's so many layers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. And we've, got, we've got some more examples. Oh, but I'm sure there's a lot. Let me, let me just share one other example while I, while I think about it. Um, oh, oh, man. <laughs> Maybe it's good that it's been a few years since I've been there because I'm not like naming names, but anyway. Right. <laughs> there's this one student <laughs> at school with me who was very politically active and involved, and they were in the student government. I was in the student government with them. I appreciated their passion and intensity, and um, they were doing a lot to raise awareness around racism and privilege and all this stuff. And uh, there was, I mean, the, the thing, other thing about Naropa is it's, it's not a very diverse student body, right? So there's not a lot of, you know, black people or African-American people there. There's mostly white people. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the student was white. There was um, a black woman student there that I got to know and be, fr and I was friends with her to some degree. And I talked with her and um, she told me the story that this student who was such a big activist came up to her kind of out of the blue and like apologized to her. And she's like, why are you apologizing to me? And she's like, I apologize mm -hmm. for my whiteness. She was like, you don't have to look at me. And then the black student was like, okay, and kind of walked away, but was really, like, she didn't like that. It didn't feel good to her. Mm. It was like, I don't want this person coming up and telling me I don't have to look at them. Like, I can decide who I look at and not look at. Right. Like, and, then that, and then at the end of the year, that student won an award for, you know, student, like, most... The white great, student? Greatest student activist, yeah. They won this, like, activism award. <laughs> and I was sitting there in the audience, like, while the award has been given, just kind of like... Scratching my head, like, wow, I just this is just such a complex picture, right? <laughs> like, who is this person really helping? <laughs> that is a great example, I think, of the ironic experience of, of what's being yeah. taught in these programs. Yeah, like, is it advancing the cause of social justice to apologize for the color of your skin and tell people you don't have to look at you because you're taking up too much space? Like, that's really, obviously, to me, that's not the answer. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> to me, that's making things worse in this really weird way. Agreed. Um, I, I think you spoke, even even <clears throat> just as a somatic therapist, even just watching your body language, <laughs> uh, you know, with the head and, you know, your go like, these are all <laughs> these, like, movements of of shame. Yeah, shame, yeah. Right? Well, so, and then the other part is I, I felt like I could never speak to that, Right. I felt right. like what was happening, what was, the way it was being taught was wrong, but I felt like I couldn't say that or I would be shamed. So then I'm like carrying this of thing, course. and now here I am, however many years later, like, I want to let that go and like move on, but like it's still kind of, it still bothers me, it's still there. It's, it's like, and that's the trauma I was yeah, speaking about. Right. That's the psychological trauma that 
was that happened in these programs and and I'm and I feel like almost in this moment of talk of saying it out loud and like <laughs> maybe some people witnessing this and, yeah, and resonating it it's healing yeah it's healing to but, be uh, able to yeah. say that of like there's something that was not right about that like I feel like I feel like what's healing is like when we see each other as human beings and can connect on that level and you can address difficult stuff and I think Racism and privilege are true, and we should talk about them. Oh my gosh, yeah. I just don't think the answer is shame or guilt or mm. apologizing for things that you were born with and didn't choose. Like, I didn't choose right. to be born a certain color. I don't believe. I mean, maybe some right. people have spiritual beliefs that you choose your life before you're born. Sure. But basically, like, I don't think we chose the circumstances that we're born in. Right. And so those circumstances shouldn't define us, right? I mean, the, the point of that they shoved down our throats was that just simply by existing as white, systemically, we're just contributing to the to the to the systemic racism. Unconsciously. And I actually I get that. I totally I, I get how the fact and this was this was my big privilege wake up call was the fact that I don't really have to think too much about this is my privilege. Mm, right. That and can, that so you can go through life not so aware of your race is a privilege that Exactly. People, Being right. like, you know what? I think that's I'm going to choose good, not to have this conversation <laughs> because ultimately it doesn't affect me because the way the system works is I'm not impacted by it negatively no matter yeah. what. See, I think there's, yeah, there's so there's truth in that, right? It's true. Yeah. And then if you are so hurt and outraged, or you, you're so, maybe you're so motivated to try to change that system, I guess like that example I give is like in kind of extreme where your right. attempts to help are actually causing harm. Right. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, this is so complex, which is why there probably won't be a resolution for a very long time. <laughs> like a really you know one that would like with justice that everyone freaking deserves but i think also that's what made the tr the trauma so um sneaky in mm. this in these programs in these education systems and i don't I, and i want to say it's not just naropa i've had conversa these conversations with people at other programs mm -hmm. and i think that you know because there has been such this this disgusting injustice around marginalized demographics and finally we're like really starting to like take action in therapeutic healing spaces there's this like push pressure obligation to really like address the non-harm Right. Like as therapists, we're healers. We don't want to cause more harm. Right, right. And I think the point of just like even as a therapist sitting in a white body with perhaps a client that's not white. Yeah. You know, being aware of like, what is that even? You know, what yeah. what is that's already a completely different dynamic and what's happening there. And, you know, so I, I get the importance of bringing attention to that, yeah. understanding that, working with that. But the way that it was done, we have residual trauma, <laughs> psychological trauma yeah, from yeah. it. Yeah, that's well said. I agree. So like, yeah. it's important to address these things and have the difficult conversations totally. and look at them. And, you know, if I'm, I'm here, a white male therapist, if I see someone and there's like a racial difference, like be able to name that and... yeah and talk about it and like right. and that's um not always easy and you know mm -hmm. to, like but i guess the point in this conversation really is like that class didn't really help me with that it made me very mm -hmm. aware of the issue it made me really aware of these issues and problems right. and how important they are but it didn't help me i didn't leave that class with tools of how to mm. really connect and engage and yeah in my experience in my opinion make a positive difference like that's what i've been trying to learn and discover on my own more and talking with people and right. maybe I can do additional training down the line. I'm sure I will. Like I said, I've done a lot of additional training since leaving, which has been part of the 
frustration, <laughs> but like yeah. just, just a, just awareness of the issue and feeling bad about it. That's not helping. Mm. Maybe that's the first step, but it's not a place to really help people from. Right. Right. Like almost cause I'm, I'm hearing kind of these two pieces of like, I got awareness, but not, but then like no skills to do like conscious action with that awareness. Like mm -hmm. how do I, okay. It's like, okay, I'm aware now what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I feel as well. And almost instead of them, them being like, okay, you're aware now. Let's teach you how to like, like very skillfully techniques, practices of how to um, feel supported in navigating those difficult mm -hmm. yeah. uh, relationships. Um, it was almost like, okay, you're aware of it. Now we're going to just like shove shame down your throat about it. Mm. And it, and that's kind of the part that felt like it was kind of like being over, you know, I'm like, well, like we're not going anywhere with yeah. this. Like I'm not, I'm this, this doesn't feel like education anymore at this yeah. point. Yeah. Not learning. It's, and their argument could be like, well, we're getting you to unlearn. Yeah, fine. <laughs> um, but to speak yeah, to this yeah. aspect of shame, and that's kind of how I describe it, and is this like these these shaming tactics, which I'm sure if any of the professors, if you confronted them about it, they're like, we're not doing that, and mm. blah, blah, blah. And I, I'll give an example that I had, which um, was so significant. Yeah was that I scheduled, I wanted to talk to the professor that I felt so uncomfortable with. Hmm. Um, I wanted, I'd scheduled a private meeting with her. Now as a rule of Naropa or the program, another professor has to be present in your one-on-one -on -one meeting. Oh, I didn't know that. That's so, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, which kind of, which kind of adds this yeah, like, bases. this adds this like two against one dynamic to be perfectly honest. You which, can't see a professor or teacher on your own. No, there has to be another one present. That's ridiculous. Yeah. There's always two professors present. Seems as... like a very inefficient use of their time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, whether it's liability or just <laughs> downright bullying, which honestly what the professors felt Sorry, like I didn't in this mean to program. Interrupt yours. No, no, absolutely. I'm glad you spoke to it because there was a lot of ridiculous things in the somatic <laughs> program that, you know, and 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 it and it did feel like um the word that I use is like bullying. Mm. And um which, you know, it just breaks my heart because I, I even have, and I will say just side tangent, I even have a hard time saying the word like Naropa in any of these conversations because to, like Naropa as a person oh, man. <laughs> was, yeah. you know, was a, was a amazing tantric Buddhist like master. Right, right. And I mean, that would be like, you know, I would have such a hard time if, like, the university was called Dalai Lama, you know, His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and to even have that, who I hold so high, mm. in the same sentence, you know? Yeah, I, I, so totally. I have a difficult time. So I'm trying to just be, like, the somatic program. Right. Because I have such a hard time even seeing the word Naropa. That, that is another irony that I have met very few students there who really know anything about Naropa. <laughs> The right. Great master, but yeah. that's another subject. Right. No, every time I'm like, ah, oh, Naropa, it's like, no, Naropa, but like, ah, yeah. oh, the institution. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, you know, it's kind of this like, ooh, all these things. But, but I, I will say when I was in that meeting, because I really, my intention was, I was like, I don't feel good when I show up in this. I, I don't feel like I can't even show up in this professor's classroom. Like <sighs> I don't feel comfortable to speak. Hmm. And I was comparing it to my last leadership program where we were just in a radical vulnerability soup hmm. the whole time. Huh. We called it ther uh, therapy on steroids. Like everyone was just emoting and supporting each other and like, it was just, it was rough and it was rigorous, but mm. then it was so cathartic and it was the it's, best two years. It's like it was more real. It was like so real. real. Yeah. It was so real. And we could talk about whatever the heck we wanted. Like, 
And, and it was never met with shame ever. Mm. It was like, whatever you want to bring, that's welcome. Let's like, let's work with that. Like I've had some very confronting conversations with other students being witnessed by the rest of like the cohort Hmm. in my leadership program, not Naropa. Okay. (laughs) So back to, back to the somatic program though, but because everything felt like in comparison to this phenomenal experience I had at my leadership school. Mm. And then I'm like, okay, great. This is a therapy school. Like it's going to be even deeper. Like we're going to get in it. Um, And it was the opposite. So I was in this meeting with the two professors and I called the meeting because I had multiple other students in my class say to me, Hey, Kate, I noticed that, um, this particular professor bleep, um, actually like silences you in class Mm. will interrupt you in class. And I was like, okay, like that makes me feel better that I, you know, I thought I was the only one that noticed that, but no, other students would voluntarily come up to me, not even me asking, hey, did you know, no, voluntarily come up to me and say that. And so I decided to confront the professor about it. And I was just like, you know, just try to approach it from like a humble way of like, hey, this is what I'm noticing. And I'd love to have a conversation about it. She, without even a second thought, turned it around and was like, actually, I notice you interrupting other students. <laughs> and it was just this immediate, like, oh. door closed. And for me, my somatic signature is my throat closes mm. when I feel scared. Because yeah. my whole life, I've had such a hard time speaking up in class. Like, it's mm. just been a thing for me. So I really would yeah. rarely speak up in class. Right. But the times that I did, she would interrupt me or interject in some way and to the point where other students were noticing it i brought it to her and without her even getting the slightest bit curious about whoa what's going on here it was turned around and saying no you do that to other students and of course in my mind i'm thinking i don't speak enough to interrupt other (laughs) students (laughs) like i'm rarely speaking how am i interrupting other students so Sounds defensive, at the least. Exactly. My throat locked up, and Mm. I sat there, Julian, for five minutes, unable to speak, literally just in this position, collapsed. Mm. My throat closed. I couldn't even speak because it felt like I came so vulnerably to Mm. her, and it was just shut. And we just sat in silence for five minutes, and then finally she was like, when you're ready to talk, we can continue. And there's another teacher there? There's another teacher. There's okay. witnessing. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. And um, I pretty much blacked out the rest of the conversation, to be honest, because I was so overwhelmed, right? Like, we know what mm. happens. You know, you just, all yeah. those sensors are just turned off. I wasn't retaining anything that was being discussed because I felt so um, shut down. Did she give an example to support what she was saying or talk about it all? I honestly, I really don't remember too much. I, yeah. I, I, knowing me, I would have been like, can you provide an example? And I don't remember anything specifically. But then we had class two hours later, different professor. Well, no, the professor that was witnessing hmm. was, was teaching right. the class. I was in the class two hours later. I was undone, just so hmm. like about this meeting I ended up having the worst panic attack of my entire life. Oh I'm not prone to panic attacks. I had them um, a little bit after my dad died, but mm. nothing like what I just experienced. Mm. What I experienced all of a sudden just rushed over me in the classroom where I couldn't even catch my breath. I started hyperventilating and I ran out of the classroom and I just like sunk to the floor in the hallway and I was just <gasps> I could not catch my breath mm. it, it was ter- it was almost like my body was having like an exorcism almost because it was like I was consciously like what's going on but my body was just totally taken over and then the professor comes out and she she holds my feet mm. and is just kind of there you know helping me she's like breathe breathe calm down 
and held like really beautiful supportive space. Um, nice. And then never followed up with me about it again. Hmm. Ever. Never mentioned it to me ever again. Oh. And I have to say that felt like such an abandonment on a lot of levels yeah. and a reflection of like, you know, care. Yeah, just like on a human level, like it sounds dismissive is the word you can imagine. Right. And it was like you were in the room when you witnessed me in that, you know, mm, right. in the thing. Right. And then you saw me have this insane physiological response two hours later. And she never, you know, there was never even like a follow-up email or just mm. like, hey, like, how are you doing? And... There was just such a disappointment in that, and that felt very reflective of when I chose to drop out of the program. I sent them an email when I was sure I was leaving. I was just like, hey, just let, like, let me know next steps. One, prof one professor followed up with me just for, um, she's not even a professor, actually. She's an admin. Hmm. We had like a closing call. N no one else ever reached out about anything. It's like they didn't even care like when you <laughs> when you decided to leave the program yeah they didn't follow up much mm -mm, there wasn't that's surprising to me yeah because it's such a small school and yeah. i'm sure each i know they struggle with money and i'm sure they want the students to come and be happy and they don't want people to drop out and but just from their point of view like to have the knowledge of why you would leave so that they can yeah apply that right but nothing yeah, you know, there was, there was this, there is such an emphasis on boundaries that it, I get the importance of boundaries and yeah. it also felt like, um, Like, there was a huge lack of empathy. Hmm. And I feel like that tone is what set most of the students to not feel safe to speak in class hmm. about yeah. the truly vulnerable things. Interesting. It's almost like something they're not even aware of. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder, that's interesting. You mentioned boundaries, and mm -hmm. so maybe from the point of view of Naropa or the administration, if they reached out to you after you decide to leave, that it would be violating a boundary. Right. I really think, I mean, I think respecting boundaries is super important, but mm -hmm. like if we're, you know, as adults, we can make them explicit and talk about them yeah. and come to agreements around them. And maybe a student wants to drop out and not be contacted again. Maybe they could ask for that. Right. Maybe you wanted some more support and follow up. Like, Boundaries yeah. don't, doesn't have to look a certain way all the time. Right. Right. They teach so much about empathetic resonance and yet people seem to really just hmm. not feel the safety in the container. And I feel like being a therapist is all about learning how to create that safety. And here these professors were absolutely not embodying, absolutely not teaching how to hold a safe container, not even from like a practical skillful level of like, hey, when you're a therapist, this is a safe container, but even embodying it themselves, they weren't even doing that for the group. Wow, it's or fascinating and the one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> or yeah, or even the one-on-one -on -one meetings. The one-on-one -on -one meeting with the teacher. I mean, Interesting. Well, I had a raging panic attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess in my experience, so I was in the program that yeah. it's called Transpersonal Psychology. Yeah. I think they've changed the name of it now. Anyway, that's what mm -hmm. it was called then. And right. it really depends. I had you know, a number of different teachers, and it really depended on the teachers. Some teachers mm -hmm. were amazing and some less impactful for me. Um, some very empathetic mm -hmm. and some maybe less so in terms of the warmth and engagement. Right. So, yeah, I think I had a different experience than mm. you with a lot of the teachers there. Yeah. But I wonder if, since I've left, because you were just there much more recently than me, if, like, 
I don't know how much of what you're speaking to comes from the administration setting boundaries or rules mm. or telling the professors to act. I'm sure that having two professors in the room with you is some rule right. that they made up. But in terms of not following up with you or not right. checking in with you how you're doing, that right. seems, I don't know if that's that particular teacher, if that's something coming from the school. But mm. Yeah, that's a know. good question. Yeah. I have no idea. And which is why it's hard for me to hold Naropa as a university responsible for what I experienced in the somatic program. Right. Yet at the same time, it is the institution at which it's a part yeah. of and obviously has rules and regulations and is clearly approving <laughs> of how the somatic program is being run. Right. They're, so it's like chicken or the responsible. egg. Totally. They're ultimately yeah. responsible. I mean, so there's like so many issues here. I feel like we could talk about it forever. forever. But like one, <laughs> one issue is... <laughs> It's, you know, the school founded by a tantric Buddhist master and the school as a whole seems very uncomfortable with its own history. <laughs> totally. But anyway, it's not for, the, for those few people out there who are wanting a more Buddhist education. Right. It's just ironic that they would go and spend so much money and not not find it there. Right. You know, like and then I mean, the other piece you spoke to is like the mindfulness and movement stuff you do before class would be super basic. I mean, I think that was my experience in the grad program as well, and that mm. was disappointing. Um, again, there's like, I think there's fear around depth, around cultural appropriation stuff, mm -hmm. but it, it shouldn't, it sh I mean, its legacy is mm. as a Tibetan Indian Buddhist school, like it should be able to carry and transmit mm -hmm. some of these teachings and insights and practices, right? It's right. not, I don't think it, it's culturally appropriating if it was founded by, <laughs> Like, that should, yeah, so anyway, there's that. Well, I mean, and, and the, the irony part of that is all these professors in my somatic <laughs> program have green tara on their wall. They have all these tonkas hanging all over their walls <laughs> in their offices. They've got, you know, one of the professors Herbies. has this beautiful purple mala that she wears on her wrist. None of them are Buddhist. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> like she like oh you didn't know that this is actually for mantra recitation like oh it's not just like a pretty little thing <laughs> um or like oh green tara is there like do you you know do yeah. practices with her like uh, no um so hmm. it gives this illusion yeah of buddhism is here yet the professors themselves are not Buddhist practitioners. Um, Maybe in your program. In our, in our program. Depends again on the... Oh, yeah, other programs course. for yeah. sure. Yeah. But my program, no. And then, um, mm. except for one um, adjunct faculty who is I deeply right. love and did my practicum with. Um, she's a true, true, true practitioner. But, um, and then the irony of their kind of like privilege, cultural appropriation, yada, da, da, and they're, <laughs> they have their, all their own, you know, accoutrement <laughs> around. So it just, it just felt very, um, the best way I would describe it is like whiplash. Yeah. It just felt like a lot like, of whiplash. Yeah. Um, around like, I'm like, hey, I'm here to, you know, I would love to bring Dharma into my, you know, studies of somatic education like i'd love to bring some like reggie ray in you know yeah, he's the yeah. like somatic buddhist king like who yes it, it was there the founding of Naropa. of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you know i'd love to do like some parallels with that yeah. and like explore some you know of the um the actual like tantric practices and vajrayana you know just the whole thing and no room for that. No room for that. No it's room for that. Terrible. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, it doesn't matter if the teacher, a teacher is Buddhist or whatever they are, but that they're a good teacher and that yeah. they support you and this, you support the students and what they want to study and right. and learn from. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've one other yeah. quick story that I think yeah. speaks to something. Yeah. It's not going to put the school in a very flattering light, <laughs> but you know, I, I finally I stuck with it. I graduated. I'm at like a graduation get together or something the next day or mm -hmm. whatever it is, like a few days later. And I'm talking to this other student who, mm -hmm. who I'm sure is like a very skilled therapist, like very sweet person. But she says to me, you know what? I have to tell you something. I didn't do any of the reading the whole <laughs> time I was there. <laughs> there was like, I was just like so struck by that. I'll never forget that. And I was like someone who's like really trying to do the reading as much as I could and think about it. And 
<laughs> and this frustration and like yeah the feeling of like like you spoke to like we would show up we'd be in class we would bow we would do some mindfulness we would have a group discussion but so rarely did that group discussion draw on any scholarly or reading material <laughs> that had been assigned or, you know so it's like <laughs> <laughs> Except in my neuroscience class, because the professor didn't know anything about neuroscience, so all we did was talk about the readings. <laughs> okay, so you talked about the readings at least. <laughs> so we talked about the readings in that class because the professor wasn't qualified to teach, <laughs> to teach, you know, whatever. <laughs> neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, oh, I hear you. I, I hear, I hear you. It's um, there was a lot of just kind of. <sighs> A lot of moving pieces, a lot of layers of both yeah. like, hey, walked out of there with like, like I said, I didn't feel, and I will say like in conclusion, like I don't feel like my year and a half there was a waste at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, like I said, I spoke to, there's some very, very valuable things that I learned. Right. Um, so you learned a lot. no you, regrets. You came to a decision the, to stop. I yeah. came to a decision to stop yeah. because, um, because it would actually serve me, my, just like my well-being, my sanity, and my health, as well as my professional career goals to stop there and mm. to pursue my business right from there. So, um, yeah. and also my body with my vision and neck and everything, it just yeah. couldn't handle um, Zoom. I felt... A level of exhaustion I've never felt oh, in my you're life. On Zoom a lot with it, so I'm sure that. A lot of Zoom. Yeah. And also, but I think it wasn't just Zoom; it was just the lack of inspiration. Oh. You know, from the it's program. Sad. <laughs> right. I just was Didn't, like yeah. so depleted oh. and diminished, and was like. You told I, me you couldn't use the word mute on Zoom. Like I'm gonna mute myself. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That. When we were talking about uh, words that were uh, degrading, I guess you could say, that were used for um, dehumanizing hmm. people of marginalized <clears throat> demographics, the, the word, word mute, the history of the word mute, um, Interesting. is... is uh, and it doesn't, it's, it's, um, I forget if you Google it, it comes up. It's on Wikipedia because okay. we all Googled it. Immediately. More about this, but. but anyway, yeah. it was brought to our attention by a classmate. And from there we, um, the professors apologized and tried to not use the word mute <laughs> for zoom. <laughs> like kind of an extreme example of the like yes. controlling our language and but um, you know and yeah. and I go back and forth on that because yeah. part of me is like you know heck yeah there's a lot of things ingrained in us that we don't think twice about because of our privilege that comes from horrific background you know yeah. horrific histories I get that and <laughs> you know yeah, and <laughs> I, you know how much are we going to also disrupt the present where it's not currently harming you know yeah. i don't know so yeah. it's not being used with any kind of harmful intention for the last right. what, 100 years I don't, at least so far as it's, i know it's tough it's a both and conversation yeah. well, <sighs> well maybe we can <laughs> come to an end here with the yeah. number talk thank you Thank you. Thanks for sharing your yeah. perspective about all this. Absolutely. My pleasure. And, and yours as well. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about my work as a psychotherapist, meditation teacher, coach, public speaker, and all of that, I have a brand new website that I am excited to share. It is a stateofmindcounseling.org. And if you'd like to support this podcast, we do have a Patreon page, patreon.com backslash a state of mind. Become a member, become a subscriber. We've got some benefits coming out for you guys. And another way to support the show is just to share it with friends, with family, to post about it on your own social media accounts. All those are great ways to support the show as well. Thank you so much, and I will see you here next time.